Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. This is Terry Donahue. I'm a principal with Springwater Wealth Management. I will be administering today's webinar with Mike Skeens, president of MasterCare America, on the topic of long-term care insurance. Springwater Wealth Management is an independent, fee-only wealth management firm with offices in Oregon and California. We host periodic conversations with individuals who bring unique perspectives to the topic of money. Before we get started today, I'd like to remind you that your cameras have been turned off and your microphones have been muted. So while you'll be able to view and hear the presentation, you are not being recorded. This conversation will run about 30 minutes. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And if we have time, I'll introduce those questions later on. This webinar will be recorded and it can be viewed later today and at any time on Springwater Wealth Management's YouTube channel. As I mentioned today, we are hosting a conversation with Mike Skeens. Mike is the owner and CEO of MasterCare America based in Portland, Oregon. MasterCare is a long-term care specialty firm which supports insurance specialists and employee benefits professionals with solutions for individuals and employers. Mike has a bachelor's of science degree in business administration from Linfield College in Oregon. He began his career in the health insurance industry with Standard Insurance Company, also based here in Portland. Jim Corbeau, a partner in our firm, will be holding the conversation today with Mike. Mike, welcome, and Jim, please take it away. Thanks, Terry. Mike, great to see you here. Thanks for making the time to chat with us today. Maybe we can get started by just having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background about how Master Care America yeah. got started and, and then tie that into how you ended up focusing or specializing on, on long-term care insurance. Sure, sure. And uh, as I interpret that, how do I make a career gym and in insurance interesting? Um, <laughs> so let me tell you about who I am when I'm not uh, working in my insurance business, everybody. Um, uh, I have 10 and a half acres and I seasonal graze cattle. Um, at my place uh, here in Oregon. And I drive a John Deere tractor as if there was any other kind of tractor. Uh, this weekend, I'm putting in my first beehive ever. I hope that I don't kill myself or at least get my neighbors angry with me. Um, my dear wife, Sandy, is my much better half. We've been married 25 years. I have two daughters that are my uh, lovely redheads on most days. Um, my youngest, I uh, just attended her graduation uh, this last weekend. And so thankfully the bank of mom and dad is almost officially uh, closed. Congratulations. Um, yeah, yeah, that feels good. It was kind of a celebration for me even though it was her graduation. Um, I have 30 years in the insurance business and, and as you had shared, um, the, uh, the first 15 was with Standard Insurance Company in downtown Portland. I took a, uh, had a number of different responsibilities with that company. Ultimately, I became their vice president of marketing. And, and in marketing, you know, it, it's a lot more than working on websites and brochures and different things. You're crunching a lot of data. You're looking at a lot of analytics. And I bring all this up because that was really my first introduction into the crisis that America was facing as it relates to, to long-term care. And we were seeing data in the early 2000s that showed us that we were on the precipice of the largest generation in the history of our nation, the baby boomers, those born between 1946 and 64 that would be turning, you know, age 60, 65. And one of the last great unfunded risks um, that most of them would have would be the need for this thing called long-term care planning. And uh, so I uh, began a deep dive academically into uh, long-term care and long-term care insurance. And about that same time, had a personal experience with it, both my wife and I. I watched both my grandparents uh, go through assisted home care, assisted living, nursing, and unfortunately, both uh, of them died in the nursing home. My wife experienced a family you know, Alzheimer's event for seven years. So we saw the personal pain um, that individuals encounter, you know, when it comes to long-term care. And, and so I made the decision um, in 2002 to purchase MasterCare. I did not found this company. Um, and uh, I, today, um, as Terry said, I'm the CEO. We specialize in long-term care insurance. 
All we do is long-term care solutions. We do so through a team of long-term care specialists through our website, ltcconsumer.com. And um, what we do is we help people that are interested in long-term care planning and becoming educated, looking at the risk and looking at how plan designs are developed and then what companies are available that offer solutions in their state. And so we take them through a regimen of, of risk analysis, education, plan design development, and then help them apply for coverage through the company that uh, is best suited and most comfortably affordable for them. Um, the last part of your question, um, Jib, which I think is more interesting that, that, that is about master care. And as I said, I didn't found the company, but I want to dwell on this because it, it, it too brings up the, the, the need for long-term care planning sure. and the pain that families go through. Master care was founded in 1988 by my former partner, um, Everett Thorne. Um, and the company was burned out of his family's pain with a long-term care event. Basically how it happened is this, that in the early 1980s, Everett received a call from his brother letting him know that um, their mother, who was living in Pendleton, Oregon at the time, had been diagnosed with senility. And um, she basically had early onset dementia, cognitive impairment. But in those days, even in the 80s, and especially in the early 80s, and especially in rural areas, we didn't have these politically correct terms of dementia, you right. know, early onset, you know, cognitive Alzheimer's, or... Alzheimer's, et cetera. And so mom just had senility. Well, like most families, um, Everett's was unprepared financially, certainly unprepared from a caregiving standpoint, and uh, especially to care for somebody that had increasingly severe dementia. And so they cared for her as long as, um, they could, and ultimately they had to turn her over to Medicaid when the money ran out. And um, she was put in the only nursing home, I think at the time um, in Pendleton. And um, she passed away after a number of years. And shortly thereafter, the family received a letter from the state of Oregon, you know, Medicare department and basically said, you know, very sorry about the passing of your loved one. And, um, but as you know, we provided care for her from this period to this period, and the total amount was X. And, and um, you know, we need to be paid this amount back, or we need to do a payment plan, or we'll right. be forced to, to execute on the lien that they'd already placed on the family home. And so, long story short, my, my former partner watched um, his family home be auctioned off um, uh, by the Oregon Medicaid Department you know, or, or, or not them, but, but because of needing to come yeah. up with the money for the care that they legitimately provided and paid for. And so he basically said to himself, you know, if I'm an insurance agent and I couldn't even help protect my own family, family from this risk, how much more so would the public not skilled in the rudiments of insurance be blindsided by this risk? And so that's really the genesis or the origins of this company, Mastercare, that I came to, Jim. So that's great. Well, I appreciate that uh, that explanation, that that kind of history and context, Mike. So, so maybe maybe talk for a minute or two about um, kind of the the overview of the long term care insurance industry since it got started. Um, sure. What were those first products like? How did they perform? And and I guess by by perform, <clears throat> what I'm getting at, and, and and you can no doubt explain this better than I how well did they serve their purpose, right? Fulfill their purpose um, mm -hmm. when, when the industry first got started. And then we can, of course, after that segue into, you know, where, where we are today and, and what products are available now and are they better? Are they more, more suitable for the need? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, the, the, the long-term care insurance market really first started um, when uh, President Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare and Medicaid into law in 1965. And basically what this did is this drew more national attention um, overall to post-retirement health care in general. And that's when people began to first research what are these new you know, plans and, and, and how would they benefit from this thing called Medicare and Medicaid. And, and it drew that attention and examination. What it drew the attention to is, 
is that it was not a federal program for long-term custodial care. You know, as most people probably on this call are already aware of that Medicare is an acute health care program for physicians visits, hospital stays, you know, things like skilled rehabilitative care, but it is not designed to provide for long-term custodial care. Medicaid, on the other hand, was designed and it did provide and does provide some long-term care benefits like it did for Everett's mother, but it was designed as a welfare program. It was designed to keep the indigent off the streets um, that may need long-term care. It's a means-tested program where people had to spend down to $2,000 um, in assets before they could rely on it. So basically, this retirement health care legislation focused Jim a spotlight on the whole issue of long-term care. And in the 70s, the first product started to be developed by a few companies. They were very basic and rudimentary. It wasn't really until the 1980s that we saw more carriers dive into the market and develop products and and compete with each other and and out of this competition we started to seeing new plan designs and things but one of the things that was still um, uh, I think a failure in some of the early long-term care products was is that they were nursing home only products and okay. uh, that wasn't done by devious design it was just in the 80s at least in the early 80s there there weren't these preponderances of assisted living we didn't have the, 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 the mature home care market uh, that we have today. And so the products were designed as nursing home only products. And it wasn't till the 1990s that when the federal government passed this uh, legislation that most on the call will be familiar with uh, called HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, this wide federal sweeping uh, legislation that had to do a lot of privacy regulations. Well, one of the beautiful things that it did is it came along to the long-term care insurance market and it standardized the types of products. It determined the benefit triggers of when a policy would have to pay for benefits. It determined the definitions for care. It determined um, what settings of care that the policies would have to provide benefits in and the home, assisted living, nursing, et cetera. And so we saw a lot of good standardization that came out of that in the 90s. Well, during the 80s and 90s, <clears throat> though, what happened to answer your question about product pricing is, is the actuaries that were doing the early pricing didn't have a lot of good data. The, the best data they could use was acute medical care assumptions. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't have a lot of data on morbidity for custodial care. And so this problem would come home to roost in the 2000s when policies were starting to go to claim in higher volumes and claim durations were a lot longer than they expected to see. The incidence of claim um, was a lot more frequent um, than they had planned on. And also people weren't dropping the policies. And, um, and so those three things, there are other things, but those three core things um, began um, uh, uh, a, a movement by actuaries to go to the states and reprice their products. Unlike car insurance, if you get in a car accident, the insurance company has the right to re-rate your policy. Right. And, and increase your annual premiums with long-term care insurance because it is so heavily regulated now that if an insurance company wanted to apply for a rate increase because they were seeing higher uh, than anticipated claims, they have to go to the state department of insurance for which where the policy is cited and demonstrate actuarially that there is a need for a rate increase in order to be able to pay out the claims as planned long-term. And so that's what happened is, is the actuaries basically missed a lot of their early assumptions because they didn't have the data in volume. And what happened, Jim, was is many of the enforced policies saw rate increases that were approved by the states. So is it safe to say now that these insurance companies have sufficient data to, um, properly price their policies? Um, are, are the policies that are being written nowadays, um, you know, less likely to face rate increases? Or is it still kind of an open question about, 
you know, if I buy long-term care insurance today, am I exposed to the risk of seeing, you know, pretty significant premium increases uh, well above and beyond the rate of inflation, say? Yeah. Well, I think the products that we have today are more durable, more stable than we've ever had in the history of long-term care insurance. The assumptions for lapse assumptions, meaning that, that, that the policies are going to be canceled or drops are the lowest assumptions that we've ever seen. Interest rate assumptions are extremely low because we are in a very low interest rate environment. Right. They have tightened up their incidence um, of claim uh, assumptions and also the duration of claims. So the products today that we have are are built with more conservative assumptions than I've ever seen in the in the history of the market. Now that said, we always caution our um, clients and say, you know, you as you consider this, even though these products are more stable and durable than ever before, need to anticipate the potential at least of a rate increase over the life of a policy. And um, that's just something that we caution out of, out of prudence. But, but sure. um, the products today that we have, Jim, are, are more you know, stable with better features and benefits than we've ever had in the, in the history yeah. of, the, of the market. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what the most popular products are right now and what the features are that, that make them popular? Yeah, there's two two basic types of, of, of products. You have asset-based products, and then you have long-term care insurance. And asset-based products are those that are typically on a life insurance chassis with a long-term care rider that's bolted onto it. And, and um, you know, because it's life insurance, it allows that the death benefit that's being built up in the policy to pay for nursing costs. You know, normally life insurance pays a death benefit to beneficiaries uh, when you pass away, but with an asset-based policy, you can basically accelerate that death benefit and use it to pay for long-term care um, if it arises. Um, and um, but let's assume that you stay healthy. Uh, and you don't require long-term care, in that case, the entirety of the death benefit could be paid out to beneficiaries you know, at a person's death. So these are asset-based solutions, highly flexible. These products are usually done as a single payment. Uh, the ones that we see typically cost around $70,000 to $100,000 per person. Uh, so if it's a couple, you're looking at you know, $140,000, $150,000 to $200,000 asset reposition to purchase one of these products. So that's asset-based um, long-term care. Most people though, don't have a need for additional life insurance, you know, right. in, in their, especially late fifties, mid sixties. And so because of that, they simply just want a, just a highly efficient vehicle. And that's why long-term care insurance is the most sought after and most affordable solution with the highest, you know, benefits in the market. I kind of call it the, the term life insurance. It's just a highly efficient peer insurance protection solution. Um, and, and most of these buyers are those that have seen how expensive care is. They've seen, you know, a loved one go through this and they just want a plan that's going to pay the maximum level of coverage in the care setting that they want. Um, these policies can be um, purchased on a monthly, uh, quarterly, uh, or an annual premium payment basis. And, or there's also strategies where, uh, people can do policies where they're paid up after a, a limited period of time, say 10 years. So, it, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So that, those are the two basic yeah. products, Jim. Over yeah. And, and I was just going to piggyback on the back of that and say, um, is there a way with either of those policies to basically lock in or guarantee your premiums to kind of insulate yourself from the potential that, the, that, that you get rising premiums over time? Uh, yes, um, with long-term care insurance, you can do what we call an accelerated payment option, um, like a 10 pay policy. That's what my wife and I did. Um, and, and we did a 10 pay plan. So we paid 10 annual premiums after the 10th annual premium, the policy is paid up and that uh, removes any recrimination from the insurance company to come back and request a rate increase because the policy is paid up. 
There's also um, single payment plans that are available as well um, uh, in the market. So that, that that's the strategy to deal with any potential rate increase. Okay, and just a, a segue off of that, if I if I were to opt for a, a 10 pay right, so I, I basically I'm not gonna make monthly payments for the rest of my life or until I make a claim, but rather I kind of front load those payments for the for 10 years. Is mm -hmm. there any risk of premium increases during those 10 years or is what I've opted for or locked into or agreed to on day one what I'm gonna pay for the 10 years? Uh, excellent question. Um, uh, the answer is during that first 10 years, you do have the vulnerability of the insurance company coming back and, and applying to the state for a rate increase. And um, it, it could happen. Um, we've yeah. seen it happen in some situations, other situations we have not seen it happen. Um, but the, the policy owners, once it's paid up and paid off, they're very yeah. grateful that it's all done. It's, it's taken care of and... Um, the yeah. policies enforced makes sense so a one pay right a single lump sum payment removes all the risk the 10 pay you hedge it a little bit and obviously a, you know a lifetime or you know whatever exposes you to that risk um in, in terms of the policies that get written is there a, a typical kind of daily benefit amount or a typical benefit period that people opt for can you maybe talk a little bit about that kind of what the the typical policy looks like yeah, there, there's all different types because people have every different, you know, budget price point and needs. Some people choose to co-insure the risk and not fully insure the risk. But to answer your question in general, the policies that we're seeing today are roughly $200 to $250 a day uh, in, a, in, a, in what we call a daily benefit. And the reason why that is is because if you look today at what the average cost of, an, of a semi-private nursing home is in the United States, it's roughly $250 a day. Okay. So we want to look at what the cost of care is where an individual is planning on retiring. You could have somebody from Oregon that's worked all their life and 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 but their vision for the future is I'm going to retire in Scottsdale. Well, we want to look what the cost of care is in Scottsdale to determine what is the best starting point to establish the daily benefit because there are regional differences sure. when it comes to you know inflation in 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 long-term care settings. And so um uh, but on average, the daily benefit is about $200, $250 a day that we see start with um, the average benefit waiting period is 90 days. So this is called an elimination period. We don't recommend anything longer than 90 days. And the reason uh, we don't is after all the years we've been in business, what we see is long-term care event typically comes when it's least expected. Mom or dad has a stroke. The kids are kind of in panic mode. They're typically decentralized. They're not living in one area. And uh, money needs to get activated now and quickly. And it's not that mom and dad may not have money, of course, in their portfolio, but it may be tucked away and, and, and doing its intended purpose for accumulation. And so being pulled out at an inopportune time could create um, adverse consequences for them. So what we want to design is a plan that will get the, the, the claimant um, money as quickly as we can um, uh, to help them from a cash flow standpoint. The other thing that we see that um, uh, is typical is an inflation rider. This is the most important part of a long-term care policy because even if we design a plan with a starting benefit of $250 a day, and that is the current semi-private nursing home rate in their area that they're going to potentially need care, the cost of care is inflating in the market. And so if we don't design a policy with an inflation rider to keep up with the cost of care, over time, what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a daily you know, benefit or a uh, uh, an expense per day of $550 a day, and sure. we only have a $250 a day benefit. And so um, it has been quickly outpaced by the inflation of the setting of care. So, yeah. And, yeah. And what about a typical benefit period, you know, two years, three years, five years, lifetime? What, uh, what tends to be the, the more typical choice there? 
the, the data that we see for the average duration of a claim is anywhere from two and a half to three years. Um, okay. uh, obviously, when it comes to, you know, an Alzheimer's dementia situation, we see claims going five, six, seven years or longer. Sure. But the average data is roughly two and a half to three years. Most of the plans that we see that people purchase are typically four-year plans or five-year plans, Jim. Just to kind of hedge against the, you know, in between that three to longer term seven cognitive related claims need for yeah, care and, yeah 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 and the, the, what's happening today is is that we are being kept alive longer because of more education about wellness and more education about health and fitness and certainly this buffet of new prescription drugs that 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 are available to us are are keeping us alive longer than ever before and so you know, people are realizing that they may need care longer as well because of their their physical health. Um, sure. Yeah. They, no, that makes sense. So. Yeah. So maybe um, just touch on uh, the the companies, the major companies that are active in the in the industry, and and how that's changed maybe over the last decade. Are there are there new players coming in? Are there, uh, you know. Uh, companies that were active that are exiting. What's the landscape look like for for the companies that are providing this this type of insurance? Um, you know, in the long term care insurance market, we've we've definitely seen a consolidation of the market. We have less insurance companies in the long term care insurance market today than we have in in say uh, the early two thousand. And one of the key reasons is is because interest rates interest rates have have stayed so low that it has been very difficult for insurance companies to invest premiums at a very, very long guarantee rate um, that they will need to support the reserves for these long-term care policies. So interest rates have not been kind to this long-term uh, risk uh, for insurance uh, carriers. The current carriers in the market today um, there are good, big, durable companies with good financials, you have the likes of uh, Mutual of Omaha, One America, uh, Nationwide, Thrivent, um, National Guardian Life. And um, these are companies that um, you know, are committed to the market, seeing it as, as long-term care planning is an essential part of the portfolio that they're going to offer to, to individuals when it comes to proper retirement planning. Excellent, so. yeah. So the last question I have before I turn it over to Terry to see if we have any questions from sure. from our audience is whether or not there are <clears throat> any um, tax benefits or advantages uh, for people who buy long term care insurance. Um, yes, there are. Um, and for individuals, you know, long term care insurance tax qualified policies are considered as medical expenses. So for an individual who itemizes um, income tax deductions, long term care insurance premiums are tax, deduct tax deductible to the extent that the premiums exceed 10% of an individual's adjusted gross income or AGI. Okay. And uh, the amount of insurance premiums are treated as a medical expense according to age base limits. And so um, when unreimbursed medical expenses and long-term care premiums exceed 10% of AGI, the amount above it can be deducted. Okay. And so for a 50 to 60 year old, that could be roughly $1,700 for a 60 to 70 year old. It could be uh, in the range of $4,500. So there are tax advantages um, uh, uh, to it. If, if it's purchased out of a, a C-Corp, it's fully deductible for both the owner and the spouse. Um, and S-Corps and partnerships um, also have uh, tax advantages as well. Perfect. Well, that's been great. Um, I know we're pushing up against our, our, uh, our committed time frame here. Terry, do we have any questions from our, our audience? We do. We have a couple. I'll start with a question, uh, Mike, about the lump sum single premium payment. And if you can just talk a little bit more about how that would work and what that benefit profile looks like in terms of the amount of the benefit and, and just how, how it would one configure that? Well, we whether it's a single payment or a, a 10 payment or an annual payment, we're, we always begin 
you know, with looking at what is the cost of care in the area, okay, that the individual is, is, is where they're going to be retiring in and, and potentially need care. So that's our starting point. What is the cost of care? From there, we develop the right daily benefits. So an example I gave to Jim, the $250 a day benefit, we attach an appropriate inflation rider with it. Um, with an elimination period. We also put, typically, if it's a uh, spouse or a partner situation, we would recommend a rider called shared care. Um, and that's an important rider when you have one spouse and let's say they go through all of their four years of benefits, but one problem remains, they still need care. Well, they would have then the ability to dip into the other spouse's benefits as well. And typically what we see is we see one spouse going longer on claim and the other one going shorter on claim. And so having the ability to, to do a shared care type of policy is an, is an advantage. Um, once we've established the uh, proper benefit design for the individuals, then what we do is we can go price it out based on um, a annual pay or a 10 pay or a single pay. Not all insurance companies will do these accelerated pay policies. So we will need to compare and contrast and, and price shop one company against another. And we have software that allows us to do that. Great, thank you. We have a couple more we'll try to squeeze in here. So if somebody already has a long-term care insurance policy, does MasterCare do comparisons with you know, what a person might do um, if they're not necessarily happy or, or maybe uncertain about the nature of the coverage they have currently? Well, uh, we can do a, a policy review. The, the one thing to keep in mind is, is, is 95% of the time, maybe even 98% of the time, when somebody has an, an enforced policy, um, they are going to keep the policy. We recommend staying with the policy unless that insurance company has such terrible financial ratings and um, is in jeopardy of not potentially being able to pay out the claim. Um, then we may recommend evaluating the insurance company. And here's why. When an individual buys long-term care insurance, they're buying it at their attained age. So if I'm 55 years old, I'm buying it as a, at 55-year-old rates. Okay, And if I buy it at 60, I'm buying it at 60-year-old rates. So if I bought that policy at 55 and I held it until I was 62 and I um, heard of this company called MasterCare and I was questioning my policy, and I wanted to, to see if it was good or not, or I was concerned about the, the, the insurance company, as, as I think this person is, is stating. One of the challenges that remains is if we go to market and we look at the new insurance company, we are going to then be looking at premium rates for you at age 62, which are going to be far higher um, than they were when you originally bought it as a 55-year-old. So... Um, for that reason, we recommend people keeping their enforced policies because those policies are never going to get any less expensive. It's unlike car insurance that you can shop around and do different things because long-term care insurance is based on your age at the time you purchased it. And the younger you are, the less expensive it is. Um, that makes the economics um, uh, tilt towards keeping your enforced policy. Okay, Mike, last question. Um, this is from one of our clients. He's basically saying, you know, back of the envelope calculation, um, he thinks it's probably a $275,000, you know, spend at some point in the future. And he's basically saying, you know, should I be thinking about whether or not I can self-insure that and, 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 you know, not buy this coverage? Or if I look into the future and don't think I can fully fund that out of pocket, should I be you know, buying long-term care insurance for some portion of it? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, self-funding is, is always an option, but here's the, the, the thing I would uh, encourage this individual to think about. And that is, do you currently self-fund your uh, homeowner's insurance? Now, the answer to that question is probably, I mean, no, I buy homeowner's insurance. And um, my question would be, well, why would you want to um, insure risk where you have a 
one out of, uh, let's say, 1,200 chance of your home burning down um, versus uh, if you're fortunate enough to reach age 65, you're going to have a uh, one out of two, one out of three, one out of four, depending on the data, um, chance of needing long-term care. Um, with your home, you know the approximate replacement value. So you know the, the, that you have a low risk of your home burning down, but you at least have a fixed amount of replacement cost. So that calculation to self-insure your home um, rather than buying homeowner's insurance is, is, is more predictable. Long-term care insurance, you have a higher risk of needing it, but you have a unknown amount of liability associated with it. You don't know whether you're gonna need care for two years or three years or four years, or God forbid that you end up getting dementia and need it for seven. And so self-insuring is certainly something that is an option. Um, but we need to examine what we're self-insuring in life um, and what we're insuring. Okay, great. We're, uh, we're up against the end here. It's uh, 1.36. We want to be respectful of your time, Mike, and of course, our participants. So thank you very much for presenting today, Mike. Really appreciate it. If people want to learn more, I assume they can go to the website for MasterCare, which I think you said was ltcconsumer.com. Yeah, ltcconsumer.com is our website. There's information um, uh, about the risk of long-term care, about long-term care insurance. And if somebody's interested in a, in a personal planning appointment, they can register their interest and a long-term care consumer specialist will be in, in touch uh, with them to, to take them through a process of education. So, yes. Excellent. Okay. And to our audience, thank you for attending today's conversation. Please look for another conversation about money in the months ahead. Uh, this conversation today will be posted on the Springwater YouTube channel, probably later today, certainly tomorrow. Uh, we encourage you all to be uh, safe, get your vaccination, and uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. Mike, again, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Terry. Appreciate your time. Take care. A pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.